I've always been a huge figure collector. The moment you enter my room, you'll immediately see the huge case of various anime and game figures I keep. I just love the artistry behind figures and love how I can use them to express my interests. But more than any show, movie, or game, my love for OCs and character design triumphs all. That's why I've recently gone into OC figure making. A couple years ago, I tried my hand at making figures with clay, but I wanted to get a more professional and polished look. In my last craft video, which you may have seen, I tried out 3D printing with a filament printer, but those usually come out more rough than using a resin one. Luckily for me, I was recently reached out to by Creality to review their Hala X1 3D resin printer. Now, I've seen resin printers in action, but actually using one seemed super intimidating, as someone who has very little experience with 3D modeling and even less with 3D printing. But I figured I'd give it a shot, especially because of all the amazing 3D resin prints I've seen floating around. People have been able to make amazing looking garage kits and figures using them, so with my love of figures and OCs, I decided I'd combine them in order to make an original figure of my OC June. So for today's video, I'll be covering the entire process, including a light tutorial on Nomad Sculpt and 3D printing. So hopefully if you wanted to get into figure making, this video might help other complete beginners and show how easy the process can be. I do want to say sorry if my voice sounds weird, I recently got sick, so <laughs> if I sound a bit congested, that's probably why. But with that, let's just jump into the 3D modeling. Before I could even start modeling, I needed a design. Last time, I ended up using a drawing my girlfriend made to design the filament figures I made, but this time I wanted to try something a little more complex. As someone new to 3D sculpting, I still wanted to go with something relatively easy though, so I decided to go with the simple chibi style, but with something more dynamic in terms of posing. I got inspired by a lot of Pop Mart figures, specifically Peach Riot when conceptualizing this design. They helped me both in terms of style, but also figuring out how to do the clothes and clothing folds. If you're getting into figure making, I'd highly recommend having a Pinterest board of some figures with the style you want to emulate. Not just for inspiration in the designing stage, but also for the modeling stage. It probably would have been smarter to make a front view and side view, as it's usually easier to just line those shapes up in your modeling program using the reference as an overlay. But but I just kind of wanted a general design to follow, nothing one to one. As far as modeling goes, I used Nomad Sculpt on my iPad. I gravitated towards this program because it's incredibly easy to learn, and I ended up picking up the basics from Dave Reed's tutorials, who will be linked in the description. I won't be covering everything about Nomad Sculpt, like the exact mechanics about how to use it, but I wanted to show some of my process and how I use simple shapes to create the figure. In Dave Reed's tutorials, he shows how simple spheres and tubes, which are called primitives, can be turned into anything you'd like to make. Using a chibi style made this incredibly easy, and I was able to make the entire body with some simple spheres and tubes for the leg. The gizmo tool makes it really easy to quickly resize your primitives to fit the general shape you'd like them, and you can swap between front and side views to check that they look good from all angles. After that, it's easy to use the move or drag tool to mold these simple shapes into more detailed body parts. I'm easily able to push the clay around and make it look similar to my reference. Here is where my real life reference photos come in handy because I can use them as a reference to how the head or body might look from different angles, and shape mine accordingly. As someone who struggles thinking in 3D sometimes, it's good to have a real life reference to go off of. Later on, I added some more spheres to be the hands and feet, and the torus shape is great for making sweater cuffs. When it comes to smaller details like the collar of the sweater or the face, I end up using the mask tool. Sometimes when drawing on an object, it can appear pixely, so I use the subdivide tool to add more polygons onto the mesh and make it higher quality. What I like about the mask tool is I can draw on features and then extrude it so it actually has mass and sticks out of the figure. I kind of changed the face a million times when working on this figure, but ultimately I decided on drawing in the outlines for the eyebrows, mouth, and eyes so I don't have to try and make things symmetrical and perfectly placed in the final. June has facial hair, but I decided I'd just paint it and only worry about the major landmarks when it came to extruding masks and making it physical. As for hair, it's easy to make with a couple tubes. You can easily use the curve function to make tubes in the general shape you like and then adjust the thickness to look more like hair. For more realistic hair, you'll need more tubes, but I ended up only using a few since I wanted that chibi look. Once I was satisfied with the general shape, I could validate each tube and mold it around to my liking, doing the same for his ponytail. I'll also include a video I used for how I figured out how to do the back of his hair, which I just used a basic sphere for, but it also shows how to make hair in depth if you are curious about that. 
Both for his hair and clothes, the crease tool was super useful when it came to adding detail. I was able to make his hair have more depth and not look as flat, and add some clothing folds that immediately made the whole thing look better and more 3D. I continue to use Pop Mart as inspiration to see how many folds I should add and how they do it to keep a figure looking chibi while also adding detail. After everything was finished, I could now get it ready for 3D print. I mentioned this in my last video on 3D printing, but I used this video to help figure out what to do. Essentially, I needed to voxel merge all the layers I wanted together. For this project, I decided to make the head and body separate since it would be harder to print them together and would just be easier to paint separately. I did end up struggling a bit with subdividing some layers and upping the resolution when merging since sometimes when you merge layer parts together they lose a lot of quality. After merging everything, I had two layers, the head and the body. But in order to make the head fit on the body, I'd have to add a head-shaped hole on the body. To do this, I duplicated the head layer and made it invisible. Then selected the invisible head layer and the body and used the boolean feature to cut it out. Lastly, I made a small cylinder and put it onto the body so it could be a peg on which the head would attach to, similar to what I did for my last figure. Using the same boolean feature, I duplicated the peg and cut it out of the head. I ended up using the flattening tool to make the hole in the head a tiny bit bigger just because I was a bit nervous that it wouldn't quite fit. I think resin prints are more accurate than filament prints so it probably wouldn't have been an issue like last time but it's better safe than sorry. After using the decimate feature to make sure the files weren't too large and the mesh wasn't too needlessly complex, I could finally export the two layers into SDL files to put into a slicer. So now onto the actual 3D printing. If you weren't aware, a slicer is a program that converts your 3D model into a usable file for your printer, so that your printer knows what to do and has all the needed information to create your figure. The Hala X1 comes with 3 months of Cheetubox Pro, so I ended up using that to slice my model. It was pretty cool using the Pro version of Cheetubox, especially as a 3D printing noob who didn't know anything about resin printing. Using the features there, it was able to fix any errors in my STL files and do everything I needed. And I was able to choose my printer type so I didn't have to worry about the size of the base plate or anything. One thing I learned about resin printing, which is different from filament printing, is that you usually want to hollow your prints to save on costs. I just use the auto hollow feature and then use the drill feature to add holes into my print. You need holes because if your figure is hollow, the inside will have uncured resin. The holes allow resin to drain and for you to wash the inside. I just deepened the peg hole inside the head so it could drain there and some holes into different parts of the body too. As long as it's on the bottom, it shouldn't be visible, but Cheetubox has a feature where you can keep the holes as a separate print and you can fill them up afterwards. Some other notable things I did was tilt the head 45 degrees since I believe people recommend it because the top side of the model is what's done in the most detail. I also lifted the figures about 5 millimeters and used auto supports to make sure everything printed properly. From what I learned, you need supports because the printer can't just print something midair. The places you need these supports are usually called islands and they need to have a support or else the print will fail. But after that, everything looked ready to print. So with that, I could connect the slicer directly to my printer and finally see my figure come to life. But first, I want to backtrack a little and show how I actually set up the printer for printing. Honestly, this was the hardest part since resin printing seemed so complex and overwhelming to me. There just seemed to be so many steps and things to consider, so I figured it might help by breaking down the whole process for those wanting to get into resin printing in a way that is simple and beginner friendly. I'll also include a video I used to figure this whole thing out in the description for those who want a more technical or detailed tutorial. First and foremost, let's talk about materials. I ended up getting a pack with basically every Everything I needed for 3D printing, save for a few small things. I was shipped two bottles of resin, the main ingredient for the prints. You may have already heard of resin before, but for those who don't know, uncured resin is toxic. You really don't want to get it on your skin, especially near your eyes, nose, or mouth. And you also don't want to inhale the fumes. So if you're 3D printing, set it up in a well-ventilated room and make sure to have some masks and gloves on hand, which luckily came in the package that was sent to me. I ended up buying some more gloves though, since you're going to be going through a lot during the whole process. Some other important things it came with was some scrapers to get supports and resin off of figures or trays, and a filter for resin to funnel through. When you're done with 3D printing, there's going to be some leftover resin in the tray, so you want to pour it back 
back into the bottle and the filter makes sure no big pieces of cured resin or gunk get in there. I ended up buying a more stable funnel though. I'm sure you aren't supposed to use the paper filter by itself, but the first time I tried putting leftover resin in the bottle, it ended up getting everywhere. Rip my carpet. Luckily, it was already pretty messed up from the amount of paint stains that were already there. But yeah, when putting resin back, be super careful. If it gets anywhere, which it probably will, have a ton of paper towels on hand since any rag it makes contact with will need to be cured and thrown away. Speaking of resin getting everywhere, you're gonna need something to clean it up. I use 90% isopropyl alcohol to both clean up any spills or equipment, but also used it to clean my prints since after you finish a 3D print, you need to give it an IPA bath to get rid of any leftover resin on it. Luckily, Creality also sent me a wash and cure station, both so I could clean up my prints and then cure them with a UV light. Again, uncured resin is toxic, so you want to make sure to cure your prints. I've seen people use nail stations or handheld UV lights, but you can also leave them in the sun for a couple of days from my understanding. But with that, I think that's all the important things I needed when it came to 3D printing. Well, aside from the actual 3D printer. The 3D printer I received, the Hala X1, was surprisingly easy to assemble. I heard that with other printers you might need to do things like level the tray, but with this it was just a matter of sliding the tray onto the top of the machine. And that's it. Honestly, I thought I was doing something wrong because of how simple it was, but that was basically it. All I had to do was pour some resin on the bottom, making sure it didn't exceed the maximum line, and I could transfer my file from the slicer to my printer. I didn't record the whole process since my phone's storage is awful, but it's super cool to watch the thing print. It prints upside down so the bottom tray lowers and lifts while the building tray stays stable. I believe this model allows more stability and accuracy when printing, and when printing I didn't come across any issues with anything coming out weird. The only thing was that the first print came out way too small. At first I was scared nothing had printed at all or it had failed, but it turns out my file was just super tiny. I must have misjudged the dimensions on the slicer. Luckily this actually served as a great test print and it turned out exactly like my model, so I knew there was no issues with it. I ended up printing a larger one later, but I ended up recording the cleaning and curing process for the tiny one since the larger one was a bit more cumbersome. In order to get the washing station ready, I just filled the container with some IPA. It's built so I could put the tray directly above the container, and there's a twist to release feature that allows the model to come off without any scraping. So luckily I didn't have to touch anything. After that, I was able to set the machine to wash mode. I just did 5 minutes since my figure was pretty small. Honestly, I feel like the washing feature is super neat but not necessary. I've seen people submerge their figures in cups of IPA and swish it around, which would require a lot less IPA than this. Where I think this machine really shines is the curing feature, but I'll show that in a moment. After taking the figures out of the IPA bath, I used my hands in the scraper to get the supports off before curing. I learned later that you want to let it fully dry before curing because it can lead to white marks and the figure not properly curing. So if you end up 3D printing, don't make my mistake by just throwing it in the curing machine. But that's what I did, I just replaced the washing container with the rotating tray to put my figures on. I ended up setting it to 5 minutes since I read online that the time was more than enough for figures and excess exposure could lead to cracking. But that was the whole process for printing figures, incredibly simple when you know what you're doing. But obviously I didn't and most of my problems I encountered happened when I made the larger print. For some reason when I first printed it, only the head worked and the body just had the supports on the tray and nothing else. But every time I tried to get it to print, nothing happened. After a couple hours I would check and it would just be an empty tray. At first I thought it was that I didn't dry the building tray fully between attempts, and then I thought my resin wasn't heated enough. So yeah, this is where the carpet resin incident happened since I wanted to try warming the resin bottle, but obviously that didn't work. In the end, the solution was incredibly stupid. I ended up using a more stable funnel to get the resin back in the bottle, and I ended up finding a huge chunk of cured resin at the bottom of my tray. The problem with this is that 3D printers work by using UV light to cure resin layer by layer, so this cured resin was blocking any light from getting through and making it impossible to print. Luckily, after I removed that, I was able to finish the body and after repeating the washing and curing process, I had a much larger figure that I could now paint. I cover painting in my other craft video, but I figured I'd show the process again if you haven't seen that video and also use the opportunity to showcase some differences between resin and filament prints. The first step is of course sanding. I used both sanding blocks and sanding sheets to get in the small cracks of the figure. I'm not sure what grit they are since they were just lying around, but it's good to have a variety. One thing I noticed was that this took way less time than the filament figure. 
You can see the filament one is way rougher and has less precise detail compared to the resin figure, which is why I wanted to try 3D resin printing in the first place. I was mostly concerned with sanding the bumps left by the supports, although I wasn't too worried about it being perfect since they weren't really that visible. I also chose to wear gloves and a mask during this process since I didn't want anything getting in my lungs and I read that resin figures can still be unsafe to touch with your bare hands until primed. But after sanding everything, I wiped it down and let it dry before bringing it out to prime. If you couldn't tell, I primed this in my garage since I could open doors to make sure it was well ventilated and to make sure I didn't get primer on my table or anything. Primer helps paint stick to the figure. I've heard some people go without it when it comes to resin figures, but I wanted to be more safe than sorry. I ended up waiting for it to dry and going over it with a few more coats, both because some parts didn't get covered by the primer and I ended up sanding down some parts and priming it again. But once that's done, I can now get to actually painting the figure. I ended up taking a picture of the figure and messing around with some colors in Clip Studio Paint just so I could get a good idea for the colors I wanted to use. But for the actual painting, I just used basic acrylic paint, adding a bit of water to it and painting my first coat. Ideally, you want to start with your lightest color first and move to your darkest since it's easier to cover lighter colors with darker colors, but I ended up mixing paint for the skin first, so skin it is. The first coats will look awful, but you just want to have patience and take it layer by layer, adding more and more layers until it looks good. You also want to make sure each layer is completely dry before going over it. If you don't wait, then you can end up picking up paint and removing it from the previous coat. It's also good to wait because if you make any mistakes, it's easy to just wipe it away with water without worrying about ruining the other colors. For parts of the face, it was a bit difficult painting such small details, especially as someone who doesn't paint that often. I had some gel pens lying around though, and they ended up being super useful when it came to drawing small stuff like the nose and facial hair. Luckily, since I made sure to extrude the eyes and mouth while modeling, it was actually easier than expected to paint those features. I continued to layer until I was happy with everything, and after wiping any dust or debris off the figure, I could now varnish it. I had this matte varnish on hand and I ended up learning from last time and thoroughly shaking it before use. I also made sure not to hold it too close to the figure so I could apply a light coat and the result was a matte finish like I had hoped for. I did this in my garage but you might want to find somewhere cleaner to do it since when varnishing you can easily get some dust to stick on it since the varnish is very sticky. So here's the final figure. I decided I'd compare it to my last filament figure to show some of the differences and ways I've improved when it comes to painting and 3D modeling. There's definitely some imperfections when it comes to this figure, but I think it gives the whole thing more charm and character rather than something factory made. Maybe one day I'll be skilled enough to make something look like an official figure, but considering my lack of experience with everything figure related, I'm super happy with the result. So that's how I made this 3D resin figure. I'd love to make a full anime figure eventually, but I've inhaled enough resin fumes to put figure making aside for a while. But if you have any suggestions for crafts I should do, I'd love to make more videos like this where I just pick up new hobbies and try to teach them to you guys. A big thanks to Creality for sending me the Hala X1 for me to try out 3D printing with. Money is always a limiting factor for me when it comes to trying new things, so being able to receive this for free was just super amazing. I've always wanted to try 3D resin printing and hopefully in the future I can experiment more with it. I have them linked in the description so definitely check out the Hala X1 and their other products if you want to get into 3D printing too. But with that, that's the end of the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching this type of thing. I always like making these videos not only because I like trying new things, but I want to inspire other people to pick up new hobbies and try new things. I mean, I have like no experience with 3D modeling or 3D printing and I was able to make something I'm really happy with and I think looks really good. So I'm sure anyone else can do it. But yeah, that's about it for me. Thank you so much and bye.